Greetings, I am Tom Earl. On this week's episode, we talk honoring your feelings with Dina. Check it out. Woo! Greetings, I am Tom Earl, and this is my year of adventure. We know you could be anywhere, so the fact that you are here today sharing your greatest gifts, your time and energy, means the world to me. I hope you know that in this moment you are valued, you are loved, and you are appreciated just as you are. As you can see, I am not alone. I have an amazing guest. She goes by the name of Dina. What's going on, Dina? Hey, how are you, Tom? Oh, I'm doing great. We took uh, our daughter to the beach for her first time ever today. She got to nice. put her feet in the ocean. She loved it. So I'm, I'm kind of riding that high right now. <laughs> so do you mind if I introduce you to the good folks out there via the bio? Is that cool? Please. Yes. <laughs> Dina has worked for over 13 years in the fields of health, social work, counseling, and education. She is the founder of a nonprofit organization focused on saving women and children from sex trafficking. She has extensive training and experience in the field of restorative practices. She has worked in the educational field to help schools in adapting a trauma-informed approach at the student, staff, and organizational level. Dina became passionate about restorative practices as she witnessed how it positively impacted students' behavior and the school culture. She currently works for a university in LA where she creates trauma-informed curriculum and trains service providers in the LA County on providing trauma-informed care to the clients and students they serve. Dina also works in the community facilitating restorative circles in an effort to help restore marriages, families, and communities. Dina's goal is to help schools and families transition from punitive to restorative practices. Mm -hmm. Powerful and important work, Dina. Thank you so much for, for joining us and being a guest here at the celebration. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited about um, sharing with you and learning. And Oh, yeah, I dig it. I dig. I don't know if you can hear my my baby, but she's she's just as excited in the other room. <laughs> like, let me in. I want it on this conversation. <laughs> so we like to start from a place of uh, the bio's dope, awesome, and you know we you don't ever really truly get to know someone just from the bio. So okay. we want you to invite us in if you're willing to. Uh, the prompt is: if you really knew me, something that you would know that you could never learn from my bio is what. Well, that's a really good question. Um, if you really knew me, my bio, you wouldn't know um, that I actually um, have a background in ballet and modern dance. And I actually, when I worked as a school counselor, um, there was a need for, but no funding for um, a dance teacher. So I coached the, the dance team. <laughs> See, that is so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Dina, I'm wondering before we jump into the interview, are there any uh disclaimers or trigger warnings or you know just anything we you think we should let the good folks know before we jump in to the subject matter? Um no, I just like to always start with I think it's the restorative practitioner in me is just um I do believe in, I think we're, especially in this climate, there's a lot of um, anger and frustration and a lot of feelings. We're in the middle of a pandemic. So um, just as we're talking, you know, I'm going to listen from my heart. I hope that you listen from your heart and we let go of stories that make it hard to hear each other. Um, and just, you know, us all be respectful that we all can have different opinions and different journeys, but we can all at least join together and respect and try to really understand and hear each other. So. I would hope that everyone just open their hearts to hear what I'm saying. I dig that. Co-signed. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to edit that, what you just said, and put that like in front of all of our interviews. We're like, oh. first, a word from Dina. <laughs> <laughs> like, da -da -da -da, and we're back. <laughs> it's a great way to start the interview. So if you're willing to take us back, I know it's in the bio a little bit of you are working and, and seeing restorative justice, restorative practices in play, seeing how it worked. Um, did you, when you were 10, 11, 12, say, hey, when I grow up, I want to be a restorative practice facilitator? Was that like the dream? 
Walk us through the journey. How did you get there? No, not at all. Actually, I didn't grow up in a very restorative um, household. So um, much like punitive punishment, which a lot of parents, I mean, a lot of families um, utilize that parenting style. So very much so authoritative, um, but punitive punishment was used to correct behavior and, you know, modify behavior. Um, And I actually didn't even know what restorative practices or trauma-informed care was until I moved to California. So um, I'm from Detroit, Michigan. I was born and raised there. And um, I ended up in the, um, I ended up getting a bachelor's degree in psychology. Um, And then I went and on to get my master's degree from University of Michigan in social work. And that just happened by accident. Like I was not planning on being a social worker. I was not planning on getting a master's degree in social work. Um, Actually, when um, I think my goal was to um, become a psychologist. And when I went to my school counselor as a um, when I was an undergrad, um, she was like, it sounds like you want to be a social worker. Maybe you should look into that. And I went home and cried because I was like, why would she say that to me? Um, so I had no, no plans of going down this route. Um, and in fact, I didn't even, um, really have uh, a plan. I, I ended up somehow like working in the hospitals, like doing discharge planning. Um, then I went on to work for insurance companies and I really was using my, um, MSW degree. Um, it seemed like I was more so going into case management, really heavily, heavily in the medical field. And then one day I woke woke up and I was working for like a really big um, insurance company making good money. And I woke up and I was just like, what am I doing with my life? Like, this is not what I went to school for. This is not really what I want to do. So I literally like I talked to my financial. I like scheduled an emergency meeting with my financial planner. And I was like, I I have to quit my job. And I knew he was going to talk me out of it, but he didn't. He actually. um he was like, no, I really think you should. So I quit my job. A couple months later, I moved to California. And that's when my whole entire life changed. And like my passion, I really found like what I'm really passionate about. And that's where I was working as a school counselor, had never worked in a school setting before. Um, I don't even really know how that came to, came to be. I like applied for like a medical job and then they placed me in a school, but I loved it so much. And I really, really loved working with the, the students. And so um, I ended up going, being sent off for some trainings, like they would send me off as a school counselor for trainings. And I did some trainings in trauma-informed care, some um, trainings um, in different behavior modification um, practices. And then the training that really resonated with me was the restorative uh, justice training. And I took, I like, it was like a, like a sponge. I like soaked up all the information. I went right back to the school and started implementing it. And we worked with um, a lot of students in, um, that had like severe behavior problems. A lot of them were first generation, um, immigrants. They had come from like, a lot of them had crossed the border, had like really, um, a lot of trauma associated just with, just the whole immigration process. And so um, they, a lot of behaviors were just them acting out because of the trauma that they experienced and were experiencing. And so I began to implement the things that I learned as I researched more about restorative practices. And I actually saw their lives change. Like I saw students who couldn't do their work, who couldn't, who, who the psychologists and their therapists had said they were not able to do certain things. I saw them um, be able to do those things with implementing this uh, this modality, and it really like really changed my perspective and um, opened my eyes to like the possibility. So I'm like really passionate about it. I know that was a really long story, but <laughs> are you kidding me? How many years did we just span? It's like so. Tell me. <laughs> and you said it in like under five minutes. Like that was not a long story. You <laughs> condensed that very very well, and. <laughs> Just to put it out there, the, 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 this whole interview is centered on you. So if I don't talk again, the folks are going to be happy. So no, no worries. Um, our most popular episodes actually have been uh, social workers, have been guests. Or social oh, really? uh, and and the, the regular listeners know my mom's been a social worker for 40 plus years. Oh, so wow. I grew up with the role model of social work. <laughs> similar to you. So, I mean, different pathway, but when I graduated from college, I ended up doing AmeriCorps, ended up in Florida, and I was learned all about facilitation with high school students, teaching them oh, the, wow. skills, the 
and discrimination. So I learned about dialogue, conflict mediation. So you're speaking my language and the language of those <laughs> are listening. So we're all like, awesome. okay. <laughs> thinking, I'm glad it's not another episode on Facebook ads, Tom. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> so, oh. Okay. So let's, let's jump into the first thing that you talked about. So um, you talked about how you were in a classroom with, with kids that, that were, were labeled as having behavioral problems. And then you really found out that a lot of it was connected to trauma. Can, exactly. Can you kind of just go off on a, a passion spree on, you know, this misconception of, I'm, I'm just gonna let you talk. I think, I think you got it from here. You know what I'm, where I'm going with this? No, I, I definitely do. Um, I, I think just saying it firsthand, because I think sometimes we think of things like we, we see ideals and th like theory and we read the textbooks and we, 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 we label uh, children based off like our understanding or our education but when you are actually sitting in front of a a child and you're hearing them tell you their story or tell you what they're what they have been through um it makes it just makes sense I, and i'll give you I, i'm more of like a storyteller so i'll just give like a, an example and then kind of explain from there so i was working with a student who was um exhibiting really um, just had a lot of behavioral um, challenges. And to put it into perspective, we were calling home probably five times a day because he was literally doing something every hour. Um, there wasn't a time when there wasn't like a problem typically um, during the school day with this particular student. And as you know, we, him and I got closer and we began to talk and he began to tell me like what he was experiencing. He had experienced severe abuse in Guatemala on um, where he came from. He had to like run for his run for his life. And like he crossed the border by himself and uh, thankfully found safety. But his brother was still in danger in Guatemala. And so um, at that point, we're expecting this student to come to school and sit down and listen and focus on schoolwork. Um, when he knows that his little brother is in the same danger that he was in, he's safe now, but his little brother who he loves is not safe. And that understanding is that I'm just trying to just, if you can even just be empathetic and put yourself in someone else's perspective, when I am having a bad day or if I'm in an argument with someone or I'm upset, it's hard for me to come to work and focus and really put my all into it. So we're expecting this student to come to school and perform and do his work well, when he literally, his family is in a life, his family member is in a life or death situation. And so um, understanding that I understood that trauma, like the trauma that he had experienced, um, which we were, you know, he was in therapy and, you know, getting help for that. But the reality is there, there was still an urgent need. There was still trauma active, you know, active trauma happening in his life. And so I understood that unless we did something to help with that situation, it would be very difficult to see change behavior modification because I mean, trauma affects how we interact with, um, the, with others, how we are able to, um, maintain ourselves, emotional regulation, all of these things. So, um, we began to implement some things to kind of help his family situation means working with the family to help that situation. And as a result, his brother was able to um, get here safely. Um, and after that, when his brother got here, his behavior, like every behavior problem he had completely ceased. Like it was no longer, he was no longer even labeled as emotionally disturbed or having like behavior problems because um, it was the trauma that, that was causing the behavior and him acting out. Um, so understanding that um, really like changed my perspective in approaching students and really asking them questions and figuring out what's going on in their lives, what they're going through. Because a lot of times children are unheard and their voices are silenced because people don't always like listen up, like and take what kids are saying seriously or understand that they have feelings and emotions that they're sorting through as well. Um, so, yeah. So how is that different than same situation or other situations where you would talk about like a punitive approach to mm -hmm. managing a classroom or youth development or even your peers if mm -hmm. someone is like go, go for it yeah you got it right so so this is and when i work with parents this is what i say okay so right now you're using punitive punishment meaning that we are like um either 
either physical punishment or like in school is detention or expelling students, something um, you're, you're, in, you're putting something neg you're inflicting something negative to, in hopes of changing the behavior. And so um, what I was noticing is that with these students, it wasn't working. Like none of the punitive measures were working. If you tell them that they were going to be expelled, they didn't care. They were happy to be at home and not have to come to school. Um, and then I mean, it just wasn't working. And so if something is not working, and, and I think the pr approach that we took even as a school is that it's our responsibility as professionals and as adults, if something is not working, it's our responsibility to figure out why it's not working because we're the educators, we're the ones who are supposed to be trained and um, proficient in this area. And so we saw that it wasn't working. So it's like, okay, well, let's try something else. And so we began to use the restorative method, which it's, um, it's no longer, I'm going to expel you because you did something bad because that it's, it was just making kids feel rejected because if kids have abandonment issues or issues with rejection with their family. And then we as a school are saying, oh, we care about you. We care about your education. And then we expel you and or put you in detention or try to kick you out. Um, it's just like this self-fulfilling prophecy, like, oh, they didn't really care. You know, it just it's like per perpetuating what they already feel neglected or rejected or abandoned. So what we began to do is to um, really, first of all, just deal with the trauma, first of all, um, really uh, using community organizations, getting them involved in therapy and therapeutic services, uh, working as a school counselor with them to really provide those services, first of all. Um, but then also, um, we began to use restorative circles. So really helping students understand why, like getting to the root of why they're behaving a certain way requires communication. So a lot of times with punitive punishment, it's kind of like, oh, you did this. So now your punishment is this. Now go sit in the room or go leave. And it's no, uh, there's no communication, no really sitting down, talking about the behavior, explaining why the behavior may or may not be wrong, um, and then coming up with solutions. So with restorative practices is really like, uh, for instance, if there was a student who, um, when, when a student behaves negatively in a school setting, it causes harm. It can cause harm to other students. It causes harm to the, to the staff members, to the teachers. And so the goal of restorative practices is really to repair harm that has been um, done um, in, in any relationship, really. And so what it, it, it requires that students take on some responsibility first, acknowledging that they have caused harm and then involving them in the process of talking, letting the other, the victim talk about how the harm um, affected them and then letting the students see like, okay, this is the harm that you caused now and look, come, we need to come up with solutions on how you're going to repair this harm and teaching that responsibility and accountability um, in the process. And so it, it not only, um, resolves situations, but it also teaches life, life, lifelong skills. So it's, it sounds like there's a different approach to power in mm -hmm. what you're talking about. Do, do you mind reflecting upon or sharing how is power different in punitive punishment versus what you're talking about? Right. So, and I actually use the restorative practices within the community. And the first thing I always talk about when I'm, especially when I'm talking to parents about like switching from punitive punishment to restorative punishment or restorative practices is you have to, first of all, we come to this circle when we're in, when we, because we call it, like I call it, a we call it a restorative circle. When we come to this circle to basically come to a resolution or fix the harm that it was done, um, we are coming as humans. We're coming, um, it's not a hierarchy, it's not this hierarchy of you're the student and I'm the educator or I'm the parent and you're the child. We are two humans coming together because we all have feelings, we all have our own perspectives and opinions and it's a place where we can um, come with different perspectives, different feelings, um, but hopefully hear one another in a, in a, in, and that's what circles do, they create an equal balance. Right. Because when you have it, like if you think about like a pyramid, there's the top and the bottom and there's this hierarchy. We want to get rid of the pyramid and put it us all in a circle where it's equal and it's like equality in terms of like hearing one another, everyone having a voice and having a choice. So what, what have you found are some of the like uh, resistance to this that you hear from from folks? Oh, <laughs> lots of, um, well, first of all, I think just 
generational, intergenerational um, beliefs. Like we were like when you were raised a certain way and it's been down through generations that I'm the adult and you just listen to what I say and you don't have the children don't have a voice. Um, it's hard to break through um, just tradition sometimes of how things are, even within the school. It, some schools are like that as well. It's very much so control. The adults are in control and, you know, the students just are supposed to come to school and listen to what the adults say, which I agree with. Um, but without like communication or students being able to have a voice or even choice in, you know, in what's going on in their lives. Um, so I think it's that tradition. Um, and the power struggle of, you know, social constructs or what we believe, uh, how things should be versus, you know, what is best for the student and what's best for the relationship. And I think sometimes that's the decision that has to be made. Do we want to like keep our ego or do we want to do what's best and what's going to be most effective for everyone? How have you seen people overcome their biases or ego or, you know, learning to like, this is how it has to be done. Have you found some ways that help people kind of transition into embracing this, uh, this approach? Mm -hmm. I think that when people see the, how effective it is, um, it is very, in my experience, when you have someone who knows how to mediate and implement it um, a, a correctly um, and powerfully, I would say, um, it is very effective in terms of increasing communication and breaking down walls of um, misunderstanding and bitterness and anger. And when you can bring um, two people together, an adult, a child, two children, two adults together, and they can communicate and they can leave, come in the circle feeling frustrated or angry, and they can leave feeling relieved or like something has been resolved, I think that opens the door to like, oh, this actually might be um, something that I might want to consider. So just my own 13 cents. I once heard somebody ask like a really respected youth development person, what do you think is the number one issue facing young people? And he said communication. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I love about what you're talking about is like empowering young people and adults both with the ability to communicate our wants, our needs, Mm -hmm. recognizing that we heard some of the whole thing. It like, it's really a communication tool and the ability to communicate such an empowering thing. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And behavior is communication. So when you see um, kids acting out, they are communicating something. And, it, and uh, I'm working with um, a, a family right now. And what, when, when, when we give the, the, the young man an opportunity or the student an opportunity to talk about what he's feeling, we're finding that a lot of his behaviors, he's the negative behaviors he's exhibiting is because he, do, he doesn't feel like he can say it with his, like say it openly. So he's acting out. And, and I think that if we give students a voice and give them an opportunity to talk about their feelings and express how they feel without repercussion, without fear, um, we will see like some of the, if they're exhibiting negative behaviors, I've seen those negative behaviors decrease because they're now able to communicate or use their emotional intelligence versus um, acting out or behaving um, in a way that communicates how they feel. Mm, damn. I hope y'all wrote that one down. <laughs> what was the phrase you said that behavioral is a communication or acting behavior out is, is communication. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so would you say, am I hearing you correctly that then a restorative practice is really to get to the heart of what are you communicating? Like rather than taking it personal as an affront on me, how dare you? Exactly. Mm. exactly. It's all about communication. It's all about coming together and listening to one another, hearing one another, because um, that's what communi effective communication is. Like we're sitting here together and you're listening when I talk and I'm listening when you talk and then we're hearing one another and we can reflect and, and, and summarize what each other is saying. And a lot of times, and as a school counselor, I used to feel very passionate about being the advocate and the voice for students because a lot of times they don't have a voice. It's like, shut up and be quiet. 
or go sit down and no one is really taking what they are saying seriously but they are humans like they have feelings what they're saying is valid a lot of times and even if it's not valid that's our job as adults to help them learn how learn how to utilize that emotional intelligence that ability to name their feelings and articulate and verbalize what they're saying that is a skill that if they don't master or they don't come be able to utilize effectively when they get older they'll be not able to communicate still acting out they'll be exhibiting these behaviors in the workplace in their relationships because they never learned it as a ch as a child so when we're when we're practice using restorative practices we're not only um helping them in the moment of like whatever the situation is but we're teaching them skills for them to be emotionally regulated <laughs> adults when they you know and and emotionally intelligent adults so, yeah. With the the skill set, the genius that you have, the experience, all of those kind of things that you bring into how you go through your life, um, how, how do you see the craziness that we are living in right now? What, what, what comes to mind? Because what you're talking about right now, I'm thinking, oh, you just described why shit's so fucked up. <laughs> like, you just nailed it because all these kids who were – like, oh, shut up, became adults and are now telling everyone else to shut up because that's what they were Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, <laughs> and because this is not just for kids. I actually use, I, I actually learned it in the in the educational setting and then I began to use it with husband and wives and use it in like community settings because um, a lot of times, you know, people are not using their words. Their, their behavior is their communication. So instead of expressing how they feel with their words and being able to uh, think logically, because a lot of times when we become upset or when we feel threatened or when we, you know, our, that emotion, our emotional brain takes over, <laughs> hijacks our logical brain and we kind of flip the lid. Um, and so it's really learning how to regulate our emotions and communicate. When you learn how to communicate when you are upset, that is learning how to regulate your emotions. And a lot of times we, as adults, um, you'll see that people can't have a, just have a conversation while they're upset. They have to say something mean or they have to curse someone out or they have to, you know, do something um, like a, they go into fight mode, basically, like, you know, we go into flight or fight mode, they go into fight mode, and it becomes very aggressive. Um, and that's because we are not allowing our logical brain to really work in us using that emotional intelligence that we have um, access to, to really express how we feel. And that's why I'm so passionate about teaching um, kids how to do that, because they're going to become adults. And if they don't learn this, we're going to be some really angry, mad, people <laughs> so, yeah how much do you think of kind of what you just described like right my my like an, some emotional part hijacking who i really am forcing like almost you know like i just now react rather than respond um how much of that do you think in adults comes from unexamined trauma um well when you just look at um like the aces study i don't know if you probably heard about that. I think we're finding even medically that a lot of people have trauma that they don't maybe even recognize as trauma, or I won't even say trauma, um, adverse, because I want to be mindful clinically. Um, there are certain criteria for trauma, but just adverse childhood experiences, um, negative childhood experiences that have affected them, um, that, that do impact their functioning, their ability to interact with others, their relationships, and even their health, right? Um, because we we're no we're learning that the adverse childhood experiences can affect um a lot of different areas of our life, like our long our just life longevity, how long we live, um, our ability, like just different medical diagnoses, different things like that. So um I think that a lot of uh unresolved either trauma or unresolved issues that people have not dealt with, um, it will it does affect you. And it, it, even if it's just like your defense mechanism or, you know, like sometimes people cannot articulate it because they have maybe forgotten about it or they don't really think about it. But like when you have experienced something, even as a child or even as an adult, and then think about it, you grow older and then you're in that situation again, and you're wondering why you're overreacting. Um, 
it may be because you are being triggered, you know, from what, what happened in the past. So um, dealing with unresolved adverse childhood experiences, trauma is so important. Uh, this this month's well, the time we're recording this Oprah magazine it's the historical one with Brianna Taylor on the cover uh, they have a huge section on it right now on trauma and that's where I heard it for the first time the study that you had talked about so basically my understanding of what was in the article and you can correct me if I'm wrong is it really talked about how um, you know, you can have these different types of physical body illnesses right that they were seeing in Kaiser and they linked it back to uh, actually these childhood traumas that people went through. That like the more like the more childhood trauma things that you went through, the more as an adult things you had like hypertension or all these different like health indicators of just like physical body health. Is is that kind of would you? That's you, absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> so um, in this in in what it what it really is showing, and I think the 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 power in it is showing that when people come to the hospital, we need to be asking questions about their, the trauma they've experienced, what they're actually going through because trauma impacts our physical health. Um, and that's pretty much what the study is showing. And that's what a lot of doctors are advocating for now. It's like when you come into the ER, you're presenting with certain um, symptoms. We need to be asking about trauma. We need to be asking about people's mental and physical, um, psychological health as well. And, you know, for my, for my folks listening, y'all, I know that a lot of us will listen to podcasts and like body hacking things. So we're like intermittent fasting and we're like getting up at 5 a.m. and meditating. We're doing all these things. And then something happens, a client pisses you off, mm -hmm. uh, your partner says something and we just like, boom, zero to 60. And, uh, and it's because of this right here It's because of trauma. And so I, I want us to, as we're listening to Dina, make sure that this isn't all just, oh, them, those people, Dina, mm -hmm. about. this is all of us, right? Do, am, I, am I missing them? Come You're on. absolutely right. And the reality is I want to also be, want us to show some self-compassion because the reality is we are all living in the middle of a pandemic. We're all um, going through this collective trauma together. This is uh, not by any means anything normal about what we're experiencing right now in this time, um, but understanding that anyone in our shoes will be experiencing what we're experiencing, like whether it's this anger or not a, the, the inability to regulate our emotions right now, or maybe we are acting out or maybe we're more frustrated or depressed or whatever the feeling is that we're experiencing, um, understanding that it's normal right now, like some level of anxiety and stress is normal. Um, but I think as um, the important part is that for us to be self-aware, like, okay, listen, I just overreacted. <laughs> Let me just be clear, like, you know, how I'm reacting right now is normal to what, you know, for us being in the middle of a pandemic. However, I want to be aware that this is happening and I don't necessarily want to be like this or I want to improve my behavior. I don't want to act out like this in the future. So what can I, what steps can I take um, to calm myself down and to, you know, be able to modify my behavior? So, yeah. So it, tell me if this is, we're, we're getting a little off, off track here. Uh, we've had past guests that I know uh, that I get messages from people when they talk about this is uh, intergenerational trauma and the mm -hmm. way that that can affect our, our physical health and our mental health. I uh, was wondering if you have any reflections on, on that or if that's something you want to speak on. Um, yeah. So intergenerational trauma, um, just thinking about everything what we're seeing right now, especially with the racial injustices that we're seeing in uh, society right now. I think looking back, just if we just want to talk about specifically about like slavery, like how um, a lot of people maybe can't see like, oh, it's so long ago. It's not like we're not you're not slaves now. It's not, a you know, you should be able to get over it. You shouldn't still be um, experiencing the feelings that you're experiencing. But realizing that um, trauma, that, that inter intergenerational trauma, how it could be passed down. Like if my great grandmother, you know, was a slave and she was experiencing like, just think about the tra traumatic experiences of being um, in enslaved. Um, and then you're free, but you still are suffering through that trauma. And it, it, it takes a lifetime. <laughs> like it, it doesn't, trauma, the, the effects of trauma doesn't just, 
go away because your situation changed. So then the, your great grandmother is raising your grandmother and some of her ideas and some of her, you know, someone who's maybe depressed is raising someone, um, raising your grandmother now. And then those things get passed down. Now you're at your mom who may raise you a certain way or have certain thoughts or have certain beliefs or have certain feelings that came through, you know, that, 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 that intergeneration, intergenerational um, line. So I think it's important to always understand not just with African Americans, all of us have different migration stories, we all, different ethnic groups have experienced different things. And there's, there's an impact that happened as a result of that, that can be passed down from generation to generation. Yeah. And I think so many untold stories of family members where you might find out after a grandma passes, like, damn, mm. that's what happened. Um, mm. You know, like for me, I didn't know personally that my grandpa, one of his parents uh, killed himself. I didn't know that. Oh, wow. And so yeah, I just I think see. of my own like family tree. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I, I think we all don't know what our parents and grandparents, like everybody carries their own story. Right. And so for me, you know, as a new father, like I feel like that's one of the most important things that I can do as a dad is to figure out what's my and I mean this like in a loving way, not putting it down, but like, what's my stuff so exactly. that she does something random. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Writes on the wall. <laughs> I'm like, no, it's like, you know, exactly. I need to own my reaction. Right. Otherwise she's exactly. going to learn mm -hmm. uh, and then pass it down. to I don't know if she's going to want to yeah. have kids too early. To tell. <laughs> and I'm really happy you mentioned that. Cause I think um, I, it's that understanding, especially when we're working or you're like with your with your child, but when I don't have children, but when I was working with my students, I had to be really reflective. Even as a practitioner, you have to watch for counter transference and all of these things. But I do remember one incident and there was a student. And for me, just through for past experiences, I don't like manipulation. I don't like when anyone tries to manipulate me. Manipulation is a trigger for me just from past trauma. And so there was a student and he would always say things that were very manipulative to me, like, because he really, um, like, if he wanted me to come to a soccer game, he would be like, I'm not going to do this if you don't come to my soccer game. And I had to recognize, like, the reason why I'm feeling this, this way is because I'm like, because I'm dealing with my own trauma. And I don't want to, in this moment, allow my trauma to affect this student. So I had to be self, that's that self-awareness. I had to be self-aware that, okay, what I'm feeling right now is actually not even about this student. It's about something in my past that I need to resolve while, so that I'm not taking it out and my frustration is not coming out in a negative uh, way with uh, the student that I'm working with. So I think it's really important. As, as, as Even as a doc, um, I'm really happy that you mentioned that like, as parents, we have to be really mindful of that. And if you don't mind me saying to the, the good folks listening as entrepreneurs, because I know it's the majority of the folks listening, we all really need to examine why we are such workaholics or perfectionists or, you know, like want to make a million dollars. Like, what are we trying to prove? What are we trying to run away from? And how is it tied to thinking external things will finally make us feel worthy? So I think that's a good place, especially for me around control. Like I noticed at first when I started my, my media agency, if a client would do something off the schedule, I would just like go zero to 60. Like I'm going to fire this client. I don't even want their money. And I'm like, where is this coming from? Like you love these people. And like, what, and it's like, comes back to like me wanting to control things. So that's like, for me, I, I had to reflect upon my own. Where does that come from journey? I like that. That where does this like reflecting on where does this come from? Mm -hmm. Like when so when you're in a moment, that's the that's it's the self awareness moment. Where is this coming from? Where is this? This is like an overreaction. Like what's going on here? Where is this coming from? I like that. So I I don't usually talk to her in the interview, so I, I hope you'll forgive me and the folks listening. No, Give me please. all these aha moments. One thing that's really helped me, I learned this from Dr. Joe Dispenza, is to write down. He said this. I challenge y'all to do this every day for thirty days. Write down every thought or behavior that you have or do during the day that doesn't serve you or is the person that you were rather than the person that you want to be. Mm -hmm. And then sit down and in that scenario, imagine yourself going through it again, but this time as your highest self, because the imagination is so powerful that your body will experience it as real. And I got to tell you that really, really worked. There's been like 
repetitive times where I noticed over the past six months that I'm like, I become a jerk. And I started to role play it in my mind in the morning. I wake up before everybody else does and I role play these five scenarios. I can become short and I've really seen a measurable difference. So that's, that's something I'll drop in the space. I'm, I'm wondering if, if you have anything that you've seen work for you, or if you want to talk about what you do in your circles or any kind of tools that you, that you kind of have been gifts that you found along the way in this work. Yeah, I think number one is just pausing because um, a lot of times like when you're talking with someone or you're in the middle of a altercation, it can be awkward to just pause. Um, but I would rather pause than say something that I don't mean or say something like out of, you know, my anger or frustration versus just taking a moment. And sometimes that can be, hey, I just need to use the restroom really quickly when we run. And like, and then I can just like take a moment to just pause and just breathe and think before we talk. Um, and sometimes I know like when, especially in, in relationships, we want to a lot of times address things right now. Some people are like very much so like, okay, I'm angry right now. I want to talk about it right now. Um, or you, you know, a child did something, we need to handle it right now. But um, sometimes that can lead to the least amount, at least effective communication. And sometimes just taking a pause and using, because it takes emotional regulation to not talk about something when you really want to talk about it. Um, but sometimes it's better just go and reflect and like you said, journal what you feel, like write it out before you actually talk, like whatever your pro- way you process things best. Um, but that pause is really important. And then also, I really like what you said before you're going into a conversation um, a lot of times when I'm like mediating a restorative circle, meaning there are two people who are at odds or have some type of altercation, um, I might meet with them separately first um, so that they will have time to process what happened um, in a space where they're not with the person who's like causing the um, anger or frustration or resentment and um, giving them that option of like, okay, so what what do you want out of this? Like really being able to solution focused and like, because a lot of times we're just arguing and we're just talking, but it's just like, where, where do we want to go? Where are we trying to get to? Because this is where we are. What is the goal? And then who you want to be while you're there? So having like, like that value, in, in, even if you're not doing a restorative circle, if you're just having a hard conversation uh, with someone or you know gonna have to address something and that leads to a difficult conversation before starting that conversation and i really like what you said is writing down those values okay i want to be patient i don't want to use curse words where i don't want to you know like letting like setting a standard for yourself so that when you go into the situation you've already like had a self-talk man you read me for a second there i am that <laughs> person who's like i want to work it out now <laughs> And I always saw that as like a strength, but now that you're like, right, it's once again, my, my need to control. Mm-hmm. And so it's actually like, like, I like how you said, it's actually emotional regulation to say, no, I can allow us both a day. Mm-hmm. That's a high five. That, that's, that's, that's hard. That's not it. That's not always easy. No, <laughs> what are you telling no. me? <laughs> but when you talk out of anger or when you talk, when you haven't really thought things through, you can end up, you can end up making the situation worse. And I think the goal is, is me saying this right now more important than a positive outcome. Which one is better? And if the positive outcome is better, then maybe I should wait and, you know, just <laughs> control this urge to talk right now. Okay, let, let's, let's do it this way. So let's address the practitioners out there. Okay. Uh, how, maybe you've seen this, where we will use all of the language of restorative circles <laughs> but in a like a you know unhealthy way where it's like so i'm hearing you you know like you're using all these phrases but it's still like Ugh. you know what i'm saying or am i am i mm-hmm. way out there right now um so let me try to um paraphrase okay. so what you're saying is like <laughs> so are you saying um there are particular practitioners who they know all the right terminology. They know the right thing to do, but they, their actions don't match what they're saying. Yeah. And you can, we can even say me, like I'm thinking <laughs> of like that situation. Like I won't yell. I'll be very kind. Uh, and I've seen other people do this too, but it's like, so I'm using all of the, like, I'm very like, uh, maybe it's almost like the, the, like where they talk about like respectability how like mm-hmm. kindness and niceness and respectability, just because you're doing those things doesn't mean you're actually practicing restorative work. Is, is that exactly. making sense on that one now? 
No, it it definitely does. So um, I think, and I was actually having a conversation with um, some colleagues about this, that um, a lot of the thing about restorative practice is why it doesn't work. And because I've, I've had people say like, it doesn't work. And I've seen it fail miserably also. Um, the reason why I think it does is because it really does come from the heart. And so we can operate out of our brain, out of our logic, we can say things with our mouth, but it's really from the heart, right? Um, like that's why I said when we started, we want to speak from the heart um, because that's really the, the goal is getting down to the, to the heart of the matter, basically. And so um, when we talk about these principles of like trauma-informed um, care, um, like transparency and giving choice, like when I'm being transparent, um, it's not a technique to get what I want, or it's not a technique to get the client to do what I want them to do. I'm being transparent because this is what's best for this relationship. This is what's best for this client so that they can get the best results that's possible. Basically, when I'm giving choice, which is, you know, very important when we're in relationships. And I can talk about that all day. I'm like an advocate for giving children choice, giving people choices because ultimatums don't feel good, right? Um, and when you give people choice, I'm not doing it to be manipulative. I'm not doing it. I'm doing it genuinely because this is what's best. This is what the, the trauma-informed model says. When people have experienced trauma or people have experienced adverse experiences, this is what helps them heal. So this is a healing process. And when you're really invested in the, like you said, the long-term outcome of the individual, then you're not just talking out of the, your, the side of your neck. You're not just talking and saying things. You're actually doing it because this is what is going to bring healing in the relationship. Mm -hmm. Y'all couldn't see because I was on mute and I had the view on full screen, but I was snapping at the part where you talked about, because I do think this can happen where you use these tools and the process as uh, like with the intention of manipulation or getting what you want mm -hmm. rather than like, okay, let me ask that as a question then. So if that's the, like not what we want, what would you say the goal, the intention, the outcome that when I enter into this space, when I, you know, take up the tools of this awesome practice, what should my mindset, intention, goal, outcome be? Um reconciliation is the long-term goal restoration repairing harm that was done healing all of these things are what that's the goal that's the purpose and so and healing is so genuine like the word in itself is so rich and it's so genuine and authentic that there is no room for um just these it's there's no room for like not being real and being you know authentic as a practitioner um, and then, you know, I think, or anyone who is in a relationship with someone, like if you're, even with, when you're interacting with your wife or your, ch your child, like if there is an altercation, the goal at the end is what for you to stay together, for the, for you to come back together as one for whatever, whenever there's an argument, even bad words that are said between people, um, dissension, whatever it is, it causes a rift in the relationship. And the goal is to bring that relationship back and reconcile and it's so genuine that it has to, everything you say and do has to be real. It has to be authentic in order for that healing to really take place. Man, you know, I'd stay here all night. Uh, <laughs> 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 I take, I take my daughter for a walk though every day here in a little bit. So we're going to need to, to unfortunately say this is going to be part one. I want to bring us back for part two. Before okay. we get there though, I want to ask, is there anything uh, that we haven't talked about that's on your heart? Where you're feeling, hey, we're going to talk about this. We can't leave without blank. Is there anything like that that you'd kind of like to to share? Um, let me pause because I could just talk <laughs> and just say something that that's not authentic. But I want to think about it. Um, and I'm I'm actually learning that myself. Is that it's okay? Like pausing is okay. Like taking a moment to really think is okay. Um, so. Something that, and I, I think because we really haven't gotten to sex trafficking, and we can maybe do that another time. But um, for this, um, I think that right now, um, with parents and children, and not like any relationship really, we can just talk about relationships because I think restorative practices, the goal of it is to restore relationships. And right now, we are, um, like I said, in the middle of a 
pandemic. Um, and there are a lot of uh, different feelings, anxiety, uh, frustrations people are experiencing um, in their lives. And I think the biggest thing we talked about is communication. Restorative practices, the, the, the essence of it is being able to communicate effectively and talk um, and have difficult conversations. And that requires that, like reiterate, reiterating the self-awareness um, and not just self-awareness, but really um, un like really thinking before we react. Um, understanding that sometimes when we when people are doing certain things, they are trying to communicate something. So we can get down and really just sit down and have conversations, like real conversations. If you really are invested in a relationship, if you're really invested um, in, in, in repairing um, a relationship, really just sitting down and having an honest conversation after you've had time to reflect and pause and really, um, really think about what you want to say and then speak. And I, I think it's just speak before you act. And um, I think that can go a long way during these difficult times. I appreciate that. And I do apologize uh, that we didn't get a chance to talk about your nonprofit and the important okay. work you're doing. Um, so like I said, part two, let's have you come back and, and talk about that great work. Does that sound good? It sounds good to me. Okay. So in the meantime, where can folks reach out to you and let you know how much they appreciate you, their favorite thing you said, their favorite quote, any of that kind of stuff to learn more, to connect, be a part of your world? Where can they do that? So my website is thecrss.org. Um, it's Community Restorative Services and Solutions. Um, and I provide different um, trauma-informed trainings and offer um, to facilitate restorative circles. And you can visit um, that website for more information. And then my social media is Dina MSW. And show notes today for folks on the go, tomrell.com slash Dina, tomrell.com slash D-I-N-A-H, tomrell.com slash Dina is where you can find all of the show notes. Dina, this was super, super epic. One of the most fun interviews I've done in a very long time. Uh, I love talking about marketing, but I think I love talking about this even more. So thank you so much for, for coming uh, and sharing your gifts, sharing your wisdom, and for Keep sharing your time. Me. Of course, of course. So the way that we end, we have a ritual, is for you to share an invitation with those who are listening. And so it can be an invitation, like what would you like to invite them to be, to do, to become, to read, to evolve into, to reflect upon? What is your invitation? Well, yeah. So I'll just um, invite everyone um, to just take a moment um, with everything going on right now, just to take a moment and just sit and reflect on how you feel, um, your feelings matter. And I just want to invite you to be able to um, understand that, validate your own feelings, even if no one else does, that your feelings do matter. Um, whether you're an, an adult, a child, everyone's feelings matter right now. Um, and they deserve to be heard and honored. And so um, it starts with you. So just, you know, take a moment, write down how you feel. Some of the t of advice that Tom gave is to jot down your feelings, what you're um, thinking. Um, and give your give yourself permission to honor your feelings because they do matter. I love that. I mean, thank you once again, Dina. Thank you for having me. Of course. And to all of those listening, as always, we're wishing you peace and blessings. Thank you. Oh, oh one, one more thing. I'd love to continue the conversation. Feel free to join me at tomrell.com slash join. Subscribe below or let's connect on social media. Tom Earl Artist. Thanks again for watching. Yay. <laughs>